right, welcome back to the show. Today I'm joined by Anthony Gels, who runs the website realcurrencies.wordpress.com. And uh, I've been following Anthony's work for a number of years, actually. I think I heard you on, uh, perhaps it was, it was Red Ice originally, but uh, he writes on banking, on usury, on uh, currencies, the nature of currencies, and uh, the history of, of central banking and usury. So uh, it's great to be joined by Anthony, and if you'd like to uh, introduce your work to the audience. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, well, um, well, nice to hear that you've been following my work, and uh, I've been writing about monetary reform for about 10 years now, more than 10 years, and um, yeah, it's maybe a long story because I've already been right, involved in the truth movement, what originally was the truth movement and what is now slowly evolving to, yeah, maybe what you could call the anti-lockdown movement or the populist movement or um, the anti-agenda 2030 movement. It's hard to uh, define these things uh, at the moment because they're very much in flux, but uh, where I originally come from is, uh, is the truth movement and then especially uh, the role of banking which is absolutely central in, uh, in the New World Order, and uh, which is uh, basically the long-standing um, real world government without you know, people ever realizing it. But um, one of my main messages is that uh, those that own the banks rule the world and have ruled the world for a long time already. And um, uh, my basic message is very simple. If you control the money supply and if you control credit, uh, we have 250 trillion debt outstanding to the bank worldwide. And in Holland alone, uh, we have something like 2,000 billion. If I think of Ireland, it must be anywhere between, uh, it must be nearing a, tr a trillion actually, um, uh, what, what, what the Irish have outstanding to the bank. And uh, it, it should be obvious, and it isn't, but it should be that um, the people that we owe this money are the rulers of the world. I mean, if you control that debt, you control everything, and everything is driven by the debt. For instance, the debt costs 12 trillion per year to service. And to give you an idea, that is one fifth of global GDP. And this ends up at the banks every year, one fifth of, uh, of all the production in the world. And that's only the direct cost of, uh, of the debt uh, and usury. There are many associated costs, but uh, uh, the income of the federal government in the United States, which is a supposed hegemon, is only three trillion per year. So if the banks have 12 trillion per year and uh, the, the federal government has an income of three trillion, trillion per year, then, uh, then it's easy to see that our idea of what is a power and where this power is, is, uh, is very faulty and, and simply superficial. And um, one of the reasons why I write a lot, why I've written a lot about this is also uh, that um, there is a fair bit of uh, discussion of banking in the alternative media, but uh, usury, the very basic operation of banking, which is lending at interest, that this is the core disease of banking. This eludes really 99% of commentators uh, on the financial system, and especially the, uh, the libertarians and, uh, and the Bitcoin uh, guys. They're completely blind to this truth. And um, they have, yeah, they've been basically mind controlled with all sorts of banker ideologies. And this is true of the left, of the right, of the center, and uh, even of most in the monetary reform movement. This, this basic, uh, tab there's a big taboo on uh, the fact that uh, making money with money because that is what this usury leads to, and, and which uh, of which uh, usury is the essence. That this money, making money with money, is the basic corruption, and uh, and that that is the the core disease of capitalism and, and of capitalism of banking, and of Western society and modernity as a whole. And um, and that is my basic message. And and this is what drives everything in the world. Those that uh, that that control the debt and that uh, have this uh, unearned income of usury and also land rents. Uh, those are the parasites that uh, that produce nothing and no value whatsoever to anybody, but they walk away with the entire loot, and uh, and the loot for now seems to be a slavery for the nations and world government for the bankers. That's what yeah. We're a, a lot of people, I think, a lot of people are are aware that there was a time when usury was not permitted in in Europe with the Catholic Church and that it's outlawed in in the Abrahamic religions, but. I guess the interesting question is how how did we go from there to what we have now, where it's just completely out of control and we have an economy that's that's built on credit. So, I mean, what what was the you know what was the the fundamental turn in in Europe that allowed the beginning of usury and how how sort of coordinated was it? 
No, that's a, that's a very good question and um, and a very vital one. And um, there is a very basic lesson of history to be learned from the answer of that question, Keith, which uh, which alludes really everybody and which is really very important. Um, what happened is that uh, there was usury prohibition in uh, in Europe. Uh, this was a result of um, the. Um, the impulse that, that that Christ brought to the world after uh, the, the coming of Christ, there was a huge wave of uh, anti-imperialist um, feeling uh, that was really uh, spreading all over the world. Uh, Eurasia, okay, but uh, this is really not not a very well understood thing. But um, this this is true, and uh, it, you know, ultimately, it took over Rome, but. Uh, um, Rome itself had been uh, ultimately was in a very similar position in the fifth century or anywhere when when it fell to, uh, fell apart. Uh, was in a very similar position. Um, it was it was overtaken by the moneylenders, and after centuries of usury, all wealth had been um, centralized in the hands of a very few, and this had become basically utterly unsustainable. And uh, because interest payments had become so high. Uh, all production was being usurped by the wealthy, and and the wealthy wouldn't take less. You know, uh, they they wouldn't uh, wouldn't settle for less. So there was basically uh, what happens all the time is that when they, when these empires are at at the end of the cycle of usury and wealth centralization, they just let it collapse, and they have done this so often in history. And it's always the same people because um, that's you know the people who are behind these empires and and who, who usurp these empires with usury because that is what what is what happening what's happening. You know the common thread in all of history. Um, um, once they have taken over society, taken over all the assets of society, then they let it implode and they move all over uh, to to a next world power that they build up. And uh, today we are in the end game of uh, of Western civilization. Basically, uh, it's not just America; it's really all the West that is now facing uh, a terrifying collapse. And um, yeah. The people who are uh, holding the debt, they are they are consolidating everything now in world government because previously they, they had smaller empires. But uh, what you can see in a common thread in history is that these moneylenders who were behind all these different empires managed to create bigger and bigger and bigger empires. And, and the U.S. empire was the field, first empire that really uh, had a, a fully global scale or worldwide scale. And... Um, if you look at the map of 1945, you will see that the uh, U.S. Army was literally occupying every nation in the world except for the uh, Soviet bloc. So um, that was, you know, a huge victory for the New World Order, basically. And um, so that's a, a broad outline of how debt and, uh, and empire and, 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 and the, uh, the ongoing process of power centralization onto a world level, how, how that has been taking place, and that's what we're dealing with now—a final consolidation on world level, because um, the West is going to be crunched in the years ahead, and uh, yeah, it's all going to result in a world government. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was actually doing some research on uh, the city of London recently for a, vi a video I made, uh, and it's it's quite staggering. I mean, when you actually look into how how the the, the banking system operates. I forget, was it Henry Ford who said that if people figured out how the banking system operates, that there'd be a revolution in the morning. Um, but I mean, you look at it and it's like, as much as half of the world's wealth is is offshored in, in tax havens like the Cayman Islands. And what's interesting is a lot of these places are really extensions of, of the city of London. So you, you get this picture that even though the, the British Empire ended, you know, and they withdrew from all their colonies and so on, that the people that were really running the empire and that were really benefiting from it, you know, they, they didn't lose any assets or any power. They still have all of their, their financial colonies around the world. Um, but would you look at an entity like the British Empire and would you see that as firmly something that was that was run by these financial elites, you know, maybe from the time of, of the Glorious Revolution? Was it, was this always an, an elite project running the interests of financiers? Like, how, how far does this go back in terms of the control of empires behind the scenes. It goes back all the way to Babylon and Sumer, but uh, the British Empire most definitely was a huge, huge, huge uh, example of this process. And uh, what happened was that um, Britain 
in the 17th century, um, first you had the Cromwell Revolution that was already a money moneylender enterprise, and 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 the moneylenders at that stage were um, located in, in Amsterdam. That was at that at that stage their HQ, and uh, there was a lot of finance there. And uh, the Amsterdam Empire, the Dutch Republic, is the first major empire in in modernity and that uh, was all, all built on the on the Amsterdam Whistle Bank where, which was the central bank of the uh, Amsterdam empire and these financiers first financed um, our friend Cromwell and um, about 40 years later the the Dutch stadtholder the um, our William 3 no, our, our William 1 became your William 3 and uh, the glorious revolution. And uh, this guy, uh, he was a tool of Amsterdam finance and uh, he had two Medici grandparents himself, too. Uh, so uh, two, yeah, everybody has four grandparents and two of his were, uh, Medici's were, who were obviously um, the legendary banking family from, uh, from Florence. And um, um, this guy, um, he brought in Amsterdam finance into uh, Britain and um, the idea was, and, and this was, you know, uh, what, what drove uh, the elites in London to welcome this, because they were thinking that the finance and the financial power of Amsterdam, that that would make uh, London a, a better Amsterdam. That was the idea. And, and it did. Yeah. I mean, um, London became uh, even much mightier than Amsterdam ever was and, uh, and ruled the world for two centuries. And, and it was completely dominated by, uh, by the bank. You, you must understand that the British Empire is basically uh, a front for the Bank of England. That's basically how it is. And, um, and it was, it was William, William Vorange that established the Bank of England, wasn't yes, it? It was exactly. the, first, the first private central bank. Well, not exactly the first, but uh, absolutely, um, it's it's the second old, uh, oldest uh, bank that is still surviving today, and um, uh, it was it was by far the biggest until then. And um, indeed, William uh, William, as a um, concession to his backers, his financial backers who brought him to power in uh, in Britain and who created the personal union between the Dutch Republic and uh, and and the British Empire. Um, well, uh, the price that he paid for that was that he charted the, uh, the Bank of England in 1694. And um, so a private monopoly of, uh, of absolute scumbags uh, got, got a complete control of the British money, uh, money supply, and uh, which, which started the British Empire. And um, to give you an idea of what actually happened in, the, in, 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 in those years and how important and how uh, disastrous these, uh, these events really were for the British people, uh, is that um, in the old uh, pre-usury arrangements of uh, medieval Europe, um, there was a huge uh, stability and um, uh, there was a very uh, high, a relatively high standard of living, much higher than people realize. And uh, for instance, the working uh, hours of a man in, uh, in, in, in pre-capitalist Britain, uh, you could, you could uh, feed your entire family uh, with with the wages of 15 weeks of work in Britain in say 1600, so you need, needed 15 weeks of uh, weeks per year of labour to feed your entire fa family, and of course uh, that is unthinkable nowadays, and it is uh, even it was even much worse in the heydays of capitalism in the uh, late 19th century when uh, Brit when the British commoner was absolutely crushed in the sweatshops and in the mines where they worked 80 hours or 100 hours per week and still didn't have enough. And uh, they had to bring their wives and their children too, and it was it was a disastrous situation. And uh, so, so this is and and this is what this this descent into slavery is is what started with the, the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, and um, and that and that has been the plague of modernity. The defining plague of modernity has been the rise of this banking and these longer and longer working hours for the common man uh, for the common man. Until it, uh, the situation started to improve after the um, after the wars, but of course the wars themselves were all, uh, were a disastrous result of um, money lender scheming as well. So uh, yeah, that that is uh, that, you know talking about these things and uh, and and these 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 facts that I'm naming now, these are the defining uh, features of our modern age, and uh, and they're obviously very little understood. But this is the true nature of capitalism and. Um, 
people are very enthusiastic about capitalism because they hate communism, eh? because we all realize that we're heading for communism and uh, that Agenda 2030 is communism on a world scale and it's a final communist revolution. And uh, But but uh, we have been programmed and people, many people still are um, uh, captured by this uh, programming. We are program, programmed to, to believe that uh, capitalism is a natural situation and that communism, uh, you know, is, is an unnatural um usurpation or um, uh, defeat of capitalism but uh, what it really what was really the situation is that capitalism is the revolutionary force that inexorably makes communism impossible um, uh, impossible to avoid I must say and it inexorably leads to capitalism because through capitalism the great monopolies have been created with usury there is this wealth centralization they used to buy everything up all the land all the corporations all the uh, and ultimately all, all the thinking, because they buy the politicians, they buy the media. And this massive monopoly of capitalism is now being consolidated in a world state. And um, the, uh, the, the, the capitalism versus communism uh, conflict is a pseudo-conflict, and, uh, and the bankers are behind both. Uh, yeah, you've said it yourself in, in some video of yours um, in these materialist monopolies eh? because that's what's going on they're both materialist monopolies and uh, yeah but and then and the third way then is the third way then is because if we talk about capitalism and communism being the two modes of uh, monopoly by uh, by the, by the bankers the, the third way is to reject this usury and this is also where I want to come back to where, where what happened in Europe, because uh, there was usury-free economics in, Euro in Europe in, uh, in the, in the, until 1500 or say thereabouts. And during the Reformation is when the uh, usury prohibition was really ended. And the reason why this happened is because um, there was only usury prohibition, but there was no interest-free credit. And this is really a vital thing to understand. So the, 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 the usury was forbidden. But there was no mechanic to provide people with interest-free credit. And as a result, there was credit scarcity in the economy. And this was a very real phenomenon. And uh, all, the, all the guys who, who uh, were trying to bring usury back in, they named this, this very specific problem of credit scarcity. And, uh, and men like Francis Bacon, like uh, John Calvin, these people, uh, they defended usury because they said, they said there is credit scarcity in the economy and because the rich won't lend without usury, we, we must allow it so that uh, businesses can, uh, can invest. Well, this is interesting, actually, because this is actually something I, I was reading about yesterday. Uh, it's kind of been interesting me lately is like the what, what caused the, the Reformation, like why it came when it did. Because if you look into it, there was actually like... There was forerunners to the Reformation, people like John Wycliffe in England that uh, tried to start their own Protestant sects, but nothing really came of them because they didn't really have, uh, you know, they didn't have state support. So what seems different about um, Martin Luther's Reformation is that he had support from princes and he had support from merchants and elites. So how much how much does does that tie into it in terms of um credit shortages in terms of uh, merchants wanting to uh, get around usury and the controls of the church. How much was that a factor in the Reformation? It was a huge factor, no doubt about it. And uh, as I already intimated, uh, Cromwell, Cromwell was a direct tool of Amsterdam finance. There's no doubt about that. He was uh, financed A to Z by them and um, and served their interests. Uh, they wanted to... Uh, to um, get rid of the um, old order in Britain and basically Cromwell's revolution was the first major Bolshevist revolution in uh, in European history. Uh, it, it was basically the, the, the great predecessor of the French Revolution and um, it was all based on Puritanism and not on outright Masonic communism as the French Revolution was but it was uh, but the real essence was that the old order was being uh, annihilated and uh, and that that was uh, the, 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 uh, the, the way was made free for, for the merchant class and the financier class to, to start exploiting um, labor and to leave, uh, leave behind the old Christian attitude of that the economy was a, factor, a matter of brothers um, uh, sweating uh, for their daily bread and that they had to cooperate and had to give each other a fair deal. And that was uh, basically an exchange for a, a cutthroat comp a competitive uh, free market system. Because that, And that is really what the 15th, the, the 16th century, the 15th century really all was about and really all modernity 
is about this struggle because, uh, of, and, and this rise of the financier class. And it started previously already in Italy, of course, because um, the Italian Renaissance was basically also a revolution by the, uh, by the financiers. It was all financed by Medici and, and Venice uh, bankers. And um, uh, already at that stage, uh, you saw that um, banker schemes were actually capturing the papacy. You had a couple of uh, banker sons um, who became pope in Italy in uh, in the 14th and 15th century, and, and at that stage, the the, the 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 old usury prohibition was be really being ignored at by um, by these popes, and uh, you know it was more and more um, leeway for money lending at interest, and and this led to huge problems already, and uh, uh, to huge uh, wealth generation or usurpation by uh, by the financier class and and what what is so important to understand is it's it's not just that they steal all this money from working people by doing nothing the problem is that they gain huge resources to start socially engineering society because that's also something that people kind of miss but uh, it's it's not just that we're totally enslaved by this usury ourselves because we are totally enslaved by usury uh, but um, it's it, it also provides them with a massive windfall with which they can buy all these artists and all these scientists and all these politicians and all these journalists, you know, to start plugging their, you know, evil ideologies, you know, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, where all this Bolshevik uh, bullshit that has been such a blight on, uh, on Europe for basically centuries now. These people are behind all that and, and they finance it simply uh, with the usury on the debt. Yeah, can I ask actually how you would define capitalism? Because this is... Um, you know, this is something I, I was kind of trying to deal with recently, which is like <laughs> capitalism has a, a hundred different definitions depending on who you talk to. But a, a lot of people see capitalism just as like freedom to trade. And so then you get you do get that false dialectic where if you're not a capitalist, you're a communist kind of thing. Um, but, you know, E. Michael Jones, I think, calls uh, capitalism state sponsored usury. Uh, which is quite interesting and would and would fit in with what you're saying. So, uh, how would you define capitalism as opposed to other systems that that have markets? Yeah, you know this whole idea that capitalism is indeed uh, defined by private property and free markets. Yada yada yada. That's all completely superficial bullshit. We had private property and free markets long before we had capitalism, and especially free enterprise, because that's really what's. Uh, what is the core issue? Uh, the idea that men, men that men produce and that they go to the marketplace and uh, and exchange their excess produ production with their neighbors that that's the most normal thing uh, that you can imagine. We had that long, 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 long before we had capitalism. That's basically just the basic uh, economy of every natural society. So we don't need capitalism for that. What happened with capitalism is the rise of unearned income and the, uh, the rise of um, um, making money with money and especially um, centered around uh, banking, usury. When you see in modernity with the rise of capitalism, it is undeniably true and co completely obviously true that historically, the rise of capitalism has been, you know, uh, the, the same as the rise of banking and central banking in Europe and uh, later in the United States. All the, uh, all the real capitalist uh, systems have always been dominated by usury and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a dominating banking system. And also the rise of the nation state would really was a, was, a, was a result of this uh, wealth centralization and power centralization because uh, previously things had been far more decentralized and, and, and power had been decentralized uh, on regional levels and uh, uh, people for centuries uh, maintained these uh, their own traditions, their own modes of government, etc., etc. But this, uh, this, this move to the nation state is very much associated with banking and um, and, uh, and capitalism simply because it was incredibly exploitative, incredibly exploitative, and uh, they needed a strong state uh, to maintain order um, while they were absolutely totally plundering and and, uh, and enslaving the people. And then, and you know, you must realize again, uh, 15 hours, 15 weeks of, uh, of labor per year for the common man in 1600, 100 hours per week in uh, in, in in late 1900. Um, of in the late 19th century, and um, and this is why they needed a very strong state to, um, uh, and including police forces, because the police forces were created in Britain at uh, at, at the height of uh, of the capitalist uh, system in, in 1850 around there. And if you read what these men were saying at the time, the the the, the, the scumbags basically that uh, that were behind. Um, 
the exploitation of labor and uh, and the, and and the installation of police forces. They they had such a complete and utter contempt for the working man, and uh, and and this showed in their their exploitation. So this very strong state uh, it was always incredibly exploitative and also um, internationally because. Nowadays, uh, white nationalists uh, often have a, a desire to defend the old empires because they're sick and tired of being um, uh, blamed for all the excesses of empire in the past. But they must, well, what I propose as a line is, is, is quite different. What I say is we must utterly reject that empire, the British Empire, the Dutch Empire, all, the, all these bullshit empires, because they first enslaved us. What happened is they, they first brought uh, the British people into slavery with their bank and, and their extra, extreme working hours and, and by driving them off their ancestral lands because we have, we have had the enclosure of the commons also. Eh? All these people who had lived on the, on the, on the land for, for centuries, they were driven into the cities and thrown off their lands and uh, it was a gruesome process and a huge degradation of these, uh, of these men who had previously uh, worked for themselves and uh, who had been their own men and uh, were next uh, degraded to wage slaves. And, uh, and, this, and this was, you know, the, these people were very well aware of what was going on and they loaded it. And uh, they, they, it caused a lot of resistance, but that's why they create the police and a heavy-handed police state. We all know, you know, how it went in, in those days. If you poached a rabbit, you were sent off to Australia. I mean, that's how crazy uh, oppressive the system was. And uh, and we must reject this uh, this British Empire. It's it's our it's our worst enemy. You know these people in London and Westminster who are, who are ba the basic, you know, uh, in, uh, institutions of this uh, of this British Empire. I mean we can see what scumbags they are. Okay, still many can't today, but uh, it is the truth. You know, I mean uh, these people in Westminster and uh, and the city, they are the absolute worst trash that you can imagine. And you know they are the absolute vilest enemies of uh, of mankind. Yeah, this is this is another thing I've I've been talking about recently because, like you said, the I, I started looking at kind of the how capitalism originated and and how we went from you know holding lands in, in the commons to having uh, this oligarchy and I mean, yeah, what you realize is that um, the colonization process started in Europe, like it started with the the enclosure process in 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 Britain and and you know exactly. there was a peasants rebellion in in Germany where a hundred thousand peasants were killed. So yes. I think it's it's really the ultimate false dialectic. As much as capitalism and communism is a false dialectic, there's this kind of colonial dialectic where they have nationalists who are being um, destroyed by this this new colonialism, this neo colonialism. They get nationalists to defend an older form of colonialism, and then they can like hold up nationalists as you know the evil boogeymen that yes. that are defending conquering exactly. non whites and so on. And exactly. nationalists aren't aren't realizing looking at the history of it that actually we were suffering, we were the victims of that colonization process Absolutely. the same way that the, the New World was. So you know from my perspective it's like I think nationalists need to kind of step outside that paradigm and embrace like a, a, a sort of right-wing anti-colonialism yes and and that's that's the place that we need to start from so your work certainly supports that as well yeah absolutely it's it's completely fundamental and uh we the the the, the worst thing that we can and and, and to, to add to that uh, keith it's not just a matter of the past. We are the ones that are being totally enslaved by this debt. The West, uh, there's 250 trillion outstanding worldwide, but at least 150 trillion of that is held by the West, by us. And all these multinational. Right. And, and I mean, and I mean, the, when you look at the mass migration into into Europe and the West, I mean, what is this but a, a newer form of colonialism? You know, with the bankers importing cheap labor for for their new yeah. colonialism. Yeah, and but but where you, uh, and and the issue there is that uh, the capitalists they will set us up against the migrants, and they will uh, the media will exploit uh, the, the the tensions that uh, you know the different uh, the mixing different ethnicities bring. They will exploit that to say you're xenophobes and uh, yada 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 and. Uh, um, they will uh, set us up against the Muslims, especially then here in Europe. But uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the migrants are simply tools in the hands of our overlords, just as much as we are. We are also simple tools. We have also also been, uh, you know, the useful idiots of uh, of colonialism and capitalism in, in in many ways. We're not just mere victims there. Uh, we we also have a responsibility uh, to take and uh, you know to 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 transcend and uh, the migrants. Um, uh, you know, no, these people are not bad people. Uh, they, they too are just pawns in a much larger game. Uh, and, and 
we basically have the same interests and the same uh, enemies as uh, as the migrants. Okay, there are also issues. Eh? I mean, uh, you know, if, if 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 migrants come here and start bleating about how whites are racist, etc., yeah, we, we are tired of that, and uh, and obviously we can laugh about that and uh, and then tell them to grow up. But um, on the other hand, if if you have people here who, who you know, you know. For instance, one of my main frustrations is um, how many um, boneheaded nationalists, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, walk after these Zionists and uh, and this uh, this obvious Muslim bashing, etc. You had you had our man Nick Griffin in uh, in Britain. He um, he exposed how he had been offered millions by Zionists. Uh, on the two conditions that he would bash Islam instead of actually attacking elite sponsored migration and that he would ignore banking as a central um, uh, driving force of globalism, which 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 it obviously is. So uh, and that's how the faux right is being organized. And, and that is how they try to exploit all these ethnic tensions. And, and of course, there are also actual problems uh, between uh, migrants and uh, and and uh, the, the the actual Europeans, but um, and, and but we must settle these, and we must be uh, adult uh, about this, and I'm mature about this, and we must realize that the struggle is not because between us and the migrants, it's not because between a Christianity and Islam. The struggle really and truly is be- between Babylon, which is centered around the financial system and which controls all Western states and all states basically in the entire world, Babylon, world power, and all the nations of the world. Babylon is bringing all of us into slavery and it's making us war against each other and 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 they're the ones that uh, that come out on top because we struggle uh, with each other that 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 is their basic game and we, and we must become far more um um yeah intelligent about all this and uh, and 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 also like as I said mature because it's all good and well to to to, to just um uh, for, you know Keep uh, at this childish level of, uh, of, of blaming people who have nothing, who have no power, who are maybe stupid people. You know, we don't even have to like them, but uh, you know, uh, they're not. They're not the power. They're not the actual the, the actual force that is driving uh, the migration and, uh, and and the destruction of our peoples, because that is obviously very much what is at stake. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think you've really hit on the ultimate means of control there, which is that the more the more migrants that are imported by bankers into Europe, the more the racial resentment grows. And then the more you have nationalists uh, embracing like a colonial history or embracing like imperial ideologies that then mean that nationalists can be held up as the bad guys. And then you have the elites doing things like, um, you know, like whiteness studies and critical race theory that says that colonialism is inseparable from whiteness. And so you have the elites passing on the the brunt of colonialism gets passed on to like ordinary working class uh, Europeans and nationalists. And you have this false dialectic where the, the whiteness studies professor is saying that. Um, an intricate part of European identity is to be a colonizer and to be destroying the the rest yes. of the world. And then you have nationalists who are saying that yes, an intricate part of of uh, of our identity is is being colonizers and uh, and being resentful of these yes. people and destroying their nations. So I mean, this is really I think once you get to this point, this is really the the ultimate means of control. Absolutely, and and in doing so, and in, in showing our allegiance to this absolute, absolute, total trash, I let there be no mistake about it. Because uh, these, as I, let me say it again, these people in Westminster, all of them, and uh, in the city, they are they are complete trash. What they do behind the scenes is is crazy, and and they're besotted with lust for power. They're totally, they're total degenerates. They they commit all sorts of crimes. They're all blackmailable. They're all totally in the bag of of, of some sort of weird cult that is actually behind all this um, uh, world government's uh, tribe and uh, agenda 2030. And uh, we should disown these people. And we should, we 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 should, we must get rid of them because this this is really the final struggle, the final uh, showdown between uh, these moneylenders. And this is a process of 3,000 years that is now coming to a culmination. Let there be no mistake. This this uh, these these moneylenders and these parasites that rule all these Western states. These are our our enemies, and we should absolutely not associate with them. And uh, we should realize also, you know, if you, if you're a rightist and you and you next go uh, complain about migration and you complain about Muslim terrorism, so-called, uh, most of it is fake anyway because it's all operated by MI6 
Netflix and, uh, and Mossad and the CIA and what have you. But um, uh, the resentment among Muslims is very real in many respects because it's a very simple fact that uh, Zion and the United States have killed millions of them there. And they have displaced tens of millions of them there. What has been done in the name of the West in the Middle East is, is disastrous. And Zionism is such an incredible cancer. And what these people have inflicted on Palestine and, and the wider uh, Middle Eastern area is absolutely horrendous. And to then, as, as, as the right uh, in, in Europe, to start associating with, uh, with these vile scum in, uh, in, in, uh, in Westminster, etc., including their Zionism, and to let our own uh, political parties be dominated by Zionist influences, who will then set us up against the Muslims, that is about as self-defeatist as, as, as you can humanly get. And, and, and that is the trap that we're in. And, and we must, these people are our enemies. We have nothing to do with them. They hate us. They hate our guts. We are their slaves. We pay trillions in usury to them every year. Their worst nightmare is that we wake up and uh, start realizing what these people have been doing. That, uh, and that is why they're warring to, against us so hard, because they, they want to destroy us, because they can't uh, afford us anymore just as much as we can't afford them anymore.